Tanakota, Tanakota, Tanakota Kato. Thank you, Deputy Vice Chancellor, for the introduction. Um, it's an honour to finally be here. Um, I'd like to start with just a couple of introductions and acknowledgements to um, a number of people. And I thought, given the topic of my um, talk today, I thought it was appropriate to talk with the volunteers in the room. Um, on the slide behind me, I've just got a few of the images of some of the volunteers I'm lucky enough um, to work with. On the left-hand side are the volunteers, my fellow parents at Thorndon School, um, who run the Thorndon um, Fair each year. Um, in the middle are the Wellington City Ambassadors, um, who are linked to the eyesight here in Wellington, and I have been um, involved with them since they set up, I think it's about now six or seven years ago. And they're out on the streets every day, including today, welcoming um, cruise ship passengers um, to the city. And then on the right are my fellow board members and um, um, some staff from Volunteering New Zealand, although this was a very relevant picture when I put it up for the presentation in November, but since then we've not only changed the Prime Minister, but also the Minister of the Community and Voluntary Sector, so things do change quite rapidly. I'd like to also welcome those from the wider tourism and events, sport and non-profit sectors. It's really great to have so many um, friendly faces in the audience from Volunteer Wellington, from the Cancer Society, from Grant Thornton, and um, those who I've worked with in a range of different capacities. Also welcome to my colleagues from um, School of Management and Victoria Business School. And I'd also like to extend a particular thanks to those of, um, from across the university who've been on the Leading People programme with me this year. We had our graduation from, um, from this leadership programme last week and this was an important part of um, my journey over the last year. I'd also like to acknowledge some research collaborators, some of whom's work I'm going to be sharing with you um, today. Here at Victoria, um, Associate Professor Ian Yeoman, who I've worked with for a number of years, uh, Dr Sarah Proctor-Thompson, Jane Fletcher from the Careers team, and also Carolyn Corgi, who's recently moved to the UK. Internationally, I'll be sharing some work that I've been doing with um, Associate Professor Kirsten Holmes from Curtin University, and Leonie lockstone -Billy, Billy from William Angus Institute, um, and also in the UK from Richard Shipway and also Professor Tom Baum. And another nice aspect of being delayed is Tom's actually on holiday in New Zealand and welcome Tom and Brelda. It's nice that you could come out for this. Um, and then finally, um, my, it was really nice that my mum could attend, but I'd also like to welcome Simon, my partner, my kids, Simon, Ben, and also my aunt, Carolyn, who's come up um, from Dunedin as well. And if I didn't include you in those welcomes, welcome anyway. So today I'm going to talk about why volunteering matters and I'm going to be doing that by focusing on the tourism and events sector and that kind of makes sense given this is my inaugural lecture as Professor of Tourism Management but I thought I'd start with explaining a little bit about how I became interested in volunteering in the tourism and events area because it's not necessarily the obvious form of volunteering you think of when you think of volunteers. Well, as um, Fraser mentioned, it all started about 20 years ago at this beautiful place in the English Lake District. This is Dove Cottage, the home of the romantic poet William Wordsworth. It now operates as a tourist attraction. And after I graduated from the University of Birmingham, I went to work here as a full-time volunteer in their marketing team and also undertook guided tours as well. I suppose it's what we'd now think of as an internship. Um, it's run by a charitable trust and employs a mix of paid and volunteer staff. And I became interested in how, why people volunteered here, but also how does an organisation attract and manage and support a volunteer workforce. At the same time, I was also a volunteer and then a volunteer leader with conservation working holidays um, with organisations such as the BTCV, which is now called the Conservation Volunteers, but also the National Trust, who some of you may have heard of in the UK. This was my first taste of being involved in volunteer management because I was looking after, for a week I had to lead a group of about 12 volunteers on an environmental conservation project and organise the communal living arrangements too. And I later realised this was the form of volunteer tourism, but it didn't strike me at the time. I think I was too busy trying to wonder how I was going to motivate, reward, and in some cases control these volunteers. 
I could see in both cases that these volunteers were really essential to the tourism organisation um, or the conservation project that they were working in. But they also impacted on the visitors as well, whether or not they were the visitors to the museum or if they were visitors, say, to a national park who were using the pass that we built, for example. And this led directly to my PhD at Nottingham Trent University with Professor Myra Shackley and Professor Conrad Lashley. I'll talk a little bit more about my PhD in a moment because I want to share some of the results and how it fits in with some of my later research. But I also wanted to sort of talk just a little bit about tourism and where volunteering fits in here. Tourism is often thought of as being big business. This is a graphic from the tourism industry Aotearoa and it really talks about the economic impact that <coughs> tourism can have. About one in eight jobs in New Zealand in some way depend on tourism. So where does volunteering fit in? Well, tourism contributes not only to New Zealand's economic um, well-being, but also to its environmental and social well-being as well. However, research like the Tourism Industry Association's Mood of the Nation research highlights that New Zealanders want to see those economic benefits, but they're increasingly concerned about things like mitigating the impact on the environment, but also some social concerns like addressing road safety. At the Tourism Industry, um, summit last November, there was a lot of discussion about the idea of a social licence to operate and how does tourism maintain this. This is about the idea that um, tourism needs the support and acceptance of local communities and other stakeholders and I believe that volunteers can play a role in achieving this. Today I'm also going to be drawing on some examples of events and I think they're a really good way to look at some of these issues here. Events are a good way of communities becoming involved um, in the tourism sector and volunteers play a really important role in delivering these events, whether or not they're large scale um, World Cups or smaller or cultural festivals or smaller scale community events like the Thorndon Fair or the Cancer Society's Relay for Life. Now just a couple of facts and figures, I think this is probably one of the few facts and figures in the presentation, but for those of you who aren't in the volunteer sector, I think it's important to emphasise the scale of it. There's um, the non-profit institute satellite account by Statistics New Zealand, um, put the number of volunteers in New Zealand at 1.23 million, overall um, contributing about 157 million volunteer hours each year. And if we look at how this contributes to GDP, um, volunteer labour and non-profit organisation contributes about 3.5 billion to GDP. It's actually much harder to give you any stats on how important tourism and event volunteering is because the data isn't collected in that particular way. But in the same study, there, is, there are some statistics on culture and recreation, which would include culture, but also things like sport. And what we see is almost, well, 44% of non-profit organisations are actually in this culture and recreation field. And importantly, actually, most of them don't employ any staff at all. So they're completely volunteer run. So whether or not that's a local sports club or a community museum, um, this is a really important sector for volunteers. The final reason for looking at this is because I think volunteering in, in tourism events also throws up some really interesting aspects which highlight some of, the, some of the dilemmas or challenges of managing volunteers. Although I've talked, given you some stats about volunteers in the non-profit sector, it's important to remember volunteers are also engaged in the public sector as well, whether or not that's at, say, a local um, council's nature reserve, maybe it's at a national, mu um, a national museum, um, maybe it's at a council-run event. But in tourism, we also see some volunteers in the private sector as well. And this can get quite controversial at times. So, for example, people volunteering at a commercially-run event or perhaps a privately owned historic house, um, or through a commercial tourism, volunteer tourism provider. We also see in this sector the interesting examples of people actually paying to volunteer, which seems to be sort of an oxymoron in many ways. But if you look at the volunteer tourism sector, there you have people paying to actually volunteer. And I'll, I'll talk very briefly about volunteer tourism in a moment. It also fits in very well with some of the broader trends in volunteering, particularly the growth of episodic volunteering, the idea that people increasingly want flexible volunteering opportunities, short-term um, or one-off experiences. So today I'm going to use this basis of tourism and events to look at, first of all, briefly what is volunteering, why organisations involve volunteers and why people volunteer, 
But then I want to move on to talking about how organisations can enhance both the volunteer experience and the, volunteer, um, the impact of volunteering. Now, I could easily fill a whole lecture in actually explaining who is a volunteer. So I've limited myself to really this and the next slide. Um, I've just used to put up here volunteering New Zealand's definition of volunteering being work done for one's own free will, unpaid and for the common good. But when I looked at, started looking at this in terms of the events and tourism sector, I did some work with Kirsten Holmes, and we looked at this idea of a model of tourism volunteer engagement. And those of whom are colleagues in the tourism sector will know that a very common way of looking at tourism is the idea of hosts and guests. And I think this fits the role of volunteers in the sector very well. So when we think of guests, we can think of the volunteer tourist, who is undertaking a social or an environmental project and travels away from their home to undertake this. And there's been a lot of research recently focusing on this real growth area of tourism. But there's also volunteers as hosts. These are people who volunteer as part of their community's tourism services. And there are different forms of volunteering that we can see here. So we can see volunteering in things like attractions, whether or not that's an art gallery, a zoo, or perhaps a national park. We can see volunteering at events, whether or not it's something like an Olympic Games, a music festival, or something like a fundraising event. But we can also see volunteering in what Kirsten and I call destination service organisations. And whereas there's a lot of research on the guests and attractions and event, these are volunteers, I think, which are often overlooked in terms of volunteering. So the Wellington City Ambassadors, the, the cruise ship, ship meet and greet programme is a good example of here. And I'll talk about some research I did with Visitor Information Centre volunteers in a moment. But there are also other volunteers who I generally wouldn't think of themselves as being volunteers in tourism, but are actually really important. So the examples in the pictures I've got here are, say, surf lifesavers. Actually, the majority of people who surf lifesavers actually protect are often tourists. And then we have things like mountain rescue volunteers. Again, often they are actually dealing with tourists as their clients um, because they're the ones who are getting in, often into trouble in the mountains. And we also, in this work, talked a little bit about, as well, that there are different ways that you can be involved in volunteering in tourism and events. You can be involved on an ongoing basis, a seasonal or a one-off or episodic basis. Most of my research is focused on volunteers as hosts, and so that's where I'm going to focus for the rest of today's um, lecture, looking at those who are volunteering within their own community to support and promote tourism. So, to start off with, I want to think about the organisational side, because throughout my research on um, volunteers, um, it has been the organisational aspects where I have focused. And one of the first things I think we need to deal with is questioning why do tourism event organisations actually involve volunteers? And some of you might kind of think you know the answer in terms of um, how much they cost, but I'll explain a little bit more. I'm going to draw on two studies. The first is actually my PhD, which, as Fraser said, was looking at heritage attractions. It actually looked at one particular type of heritage attraction in the UK, and that was looking at writers' homes. So I looked at how um, museums and historic properties that had a link to a famous or sometimes not so famous writer um, involved volunteers in their programmes. And then secondly, I'll talk a little bit about a study that I did on visit information centres in Australia, also with Kirsten Holmes from Curtin University. Across both of these studies, it's not surprising that need was a really dominant reason why organisations said they involved volunteers. Um, for many of them, they sort of saw that there were funding constraints and volunteers are a way to actually often keep the organisation running. But it's important to realise that volunteers aren't free, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of slides um, time. And running a successful volunteer programme actually requires quite an input of resources. But particularly in the literary, property, the literary museums, but also in the visitor information centres, there was also a recognition that there were more positive reasons for an organisation involving volunteers as well. And the first one was this was a key way to actually engage the community with the organisation. There were a way to actually foster a sense of community ownership about a particular tourism event or resource. 
Um, in some rural areas, the volunteers, the visitor centre or the museum becomes almost the social hub of the community um, where people gather. There's also the personal qualities and motivations of volunteers, their passion, their enthusiasm, their skills, their knowledge that they can bring to um, an organisation. And there was also a recognition that um, volunteers can impact on the visitor experience, that tourists can interact, um, like interacting with local people, and that volunteers can be ambassadors, not just for the organisation where they volunteer, but also for their de the destination and community more generally, and make visitors feel welcome. This quote from a visitor centre manager in Australia, I think sort of sums this up. She said, we're selling an experience here, and visitors love to hear from someone who's lived here for 20 years, or has lived here for 70 years or so. And that's what, really what the visitor gets in the experience. They're getting that local knowledge, they're getting those little stories. And this, I think, really speaks to the, sort of the motivations of visitors in terms of actually engaging in the experience within a community. Kirsten and I continued this theme by looking more in depth at some volunteer programmes, looking particularly at zoo volunteer programmes, to recognise that while there are benefits from um, hosting volunteers, there can also be significant costs as well. So many of the benefits that came in the study I've mentioned already, although I think probably the last one's worth noting as well, that volunteering can also have health and education outcomes for volunteers, whether or not that's the students that we see who volunteer and gain experience they can take into the workplace, or the mental and physical health benefits that volunteering can bring as well. But it's worth noting the costs of volunteering as well that um, an organisation who wants to involve volunteers need to recognise that there will be staff time to recruit, train and manage them, that there needs to often be facilities for volunteers, whether or not that's a break room or somewhere for them to store their staff whilst they're volunteering. They need investment through things like training and rewards and recognition. Often you need to invest in their uniform, perhaps out of pocket expenses, so that you enable people from a wide range of socio-economic groups to volunteer and also things like insurance as well. Now I'll come back later on in the lecture to talk a little bit more about this idea of balancing the costs and benefits, particularly when we get to the value of volunteering. But I want to flip over now and talk a little bit about the volunteers themselves and think about why would somebody volunteer in tourism and events. People volunteer for lots of different reasons. People have very personal mo motivations and reasons for volunteering. There's lots of different places and organisations you can volunteer with. Volunteer Wellington, for example, if you look at some of the organisations that they support the recruitment of volunteers for, you can volunteer at the Portrait Gallery at Old St Paul's up the road, at Wellington Zoo, at, at Round the Bays, through Sport Wellington. There's lots of opportunities available. But why would somebody choose these organisations rather than, for example, and this is from Seek Volunteer, you can volunteer with animal welfare, or disability services, disaster relief, refugee and migrant support. What is it about tourism and events that bring volunteers? Why, why volunteer at tourism and events? So I'm going to talk about three studies. I'll talk briefly again about some of my PhD research, but I'm then going to also talk about two studies that I've been involved with in terms of event volunteering. The first is a big study I did with Rugby World Cup volunteers, and then the other is looking at volunteers at four of sporting events here in New Zealand and in Australia. So in my PhD research, whilst my main focus was on the management of volunteers, I did also look at some of the reasons why people volunteered, because in order to manage volunteers, it helps if you know why they're, why they're there. So, not surprisingly, altruism is important in terms of a motivation for volunteering. Often in this, these literary heritage museums, it was about preserving local heritage or buildings, or feeling volunteering was part of their civic responsibility. But actually, self-interest was just as important. So, and this is really important to realise from a management perspective, because just reacting to those altruistic motivations is often not going to be enough. So what was self-interest? Well, that could be that simply people had leisure time and they wanted to fill it. Many of those who volunteer, for example, in literary museums were retired and were looking for something to do with their time. But there were also subject-related um, factors as well. Perhaps a personal interest in the collection or the locate the local history. There were strong social motivations. People, uh, volunteers, 
getting involved because they wanted to meet other people, maybe wanting to meet tourists, but also just meet other people within their community. And there was also some volunteers for whom gaining skills and experience was also important. Now you might expect with a literary heritage site where a place that a writer had lived, that the writer was going to be part of those motivations. But one of the things that came out quite strongly in my research was that wasn't always the case. In fact, there was only a very small number of volunteers who I classified as literary addicts who came to volunteer because they were passionate about the particular writer. In fact, the majority would be better classified as amateurs. They often knew little or some cases nothing about the writer before they approached the organisation to volunteer or responded to a recruitment advert. They actually were often were quite nervous about their lack of knowledge because they felt this meant they wouldn't be accepted as a volunteer. But as we'll see a little bit later on, whilst they started with minimal knowledge, the, the literary aspects became an important part of their rewards. When I did the study at Rugby World um, Cup, this focused on the volunteers, and we surveyed the volunteers on, in a longitudinal project five times across about, it was about an 18 month period. And through that, we were able to track some of the changes that people experienced being involved in a major event. I'm just going to draw out a few of the small aspects from this study, but one I want to start with is the work we did looking at um, the motivations of volunteers. People had lots of reasons to volunteer at Rugby World Cup, but two broad areas captured the main ones. The first is they wanted to be part of a once-in-a-lifetime event. They saw New Zealand hosting Rugby World Cup as something they may not see again in their lifetime, and they wanted to be part of this event. But there was also a desire for social interaction. People talked about wanting to meet people. They wanted to meet sometimes the players, but as much they wanted to meet, say, tourists and fans who were going to be coming to the event. There were some other motivations as well, which were important for some but not all volunteers, such as gaining experience or developing particular skills. But rugby was an interesting one. Um, probably only about a third of those who responded to the survey for, said that rugby was an important motivation for them. In fact, about a third of them were actually quite adamant it was not part of the reason that they were volunteering. And I think it demonstrates that a big event like a, a World Cup can actually cross boundaries. It can move away from the focus, actual, focus sport and actually draw people into just the excitement of the event overall. The final example I want to use to talk about motivation is a study that um, uh, Kirsten Holmes, Leonie Lockstone Binney, Tom, who's over here, and uh, Caroline Storer at, from Curtin University as well um, did. And we recognised that a lot of the research going on in the events um, volunteering sector was a bit like my Rugby World Cup study. It was looking at one event in detail. So we started a project where we tried to use the same research tool at a number of different events. And this is a, a paper that we published looking at volunteering at four different sporting events. And the photograph at the top is the Avon Descent. This is a kind of kayak and power dinghy race. It takes place over two days in Western Australia and basically goes down the um, Avon River. We looked at some equestrian events in Western Australia. We looked at the Rugby Sevens here in Wellington. And we also looked at the World Sailing Champs, which were hosted in Perth in 2011. And in it, we used um, cluster analysis to try and understand about why volunteers were there. And we identified three clusters of volunteers. Um, there are altruists, those who want to do something useful and contribute to their community and event. This is about a fifth of those who, who responded to the survey. These people were likely to already be volunteering in their own communities and would like to volunteer again after the event as well. But the largest group, with 43% of the respondents, were the socials. They were motivated by social interaction, interaction, identification with their group and community, and wanting to be involved. We call it networking, but not necessarily in a business kind of sense, but a way to engage with others in their community. And then we had the indifference. These were actually scored low on all of this, almost all of the scale, scale items we had about motivation. And really, they seemed to be there because they were pushed by some degree by external influences. This is about a third of the respondents. They actually had quite low levels of satisfaction, and they weren't interested in volunteering again in the future. 
And that's important to realise, because I'm going to come back to that in a moment, about how we then try and understand uh, what volunteering um, means. Now, a lot of research in the sector stops there. It tells us why people um, um, volunteer, but it doesn't ask the so what question. So a lot of my research has been about going into the so what. So rather than just looking at motivations, what does that mean for those, those trying to manage and enhance the volunteer experience? How do we reward those motivations? How do we take those expectations and actually deliver outstanding experiences? And in talking through this, I'm going to try and emphasise two particularly important aspects. One is the importance of volunteer management, and secondly, second is the importance of managers of volunteers. So let me return to those three studies I've just told you about. The volunteers at sports events. If you're an organiser of an event, you really need to focus on the altruists and the socials. These are volunteers that if you put the effort into, you can retain them and get them back to your event in the future, or potentially encourage them to volunteer elsewhere. There are a variety of communication tools that you can use, but the, in fact the messages that you need to use are actually different. So with the altruists, the messages you need to use is that they have to, are to reinforce their contribution to the event, and as part of that, their contribution to their local community. This is particularly seen in the Avon Descent event, where often the volunteers were associated with community groups like Rotary or Lions or the Scouts, and actually emphasising the importance of those groups as part of the event was key. The socials, not surprisingly, the communication you need with them is the opportunities they have to engage and network with others. Give them a feeling of belonging to an event community that they want to return to in the future. The indifference aren't going to volunteer, are unlikely to volunteer again. So instead of trying to encourage them to do that, it's better to actually focus on training them well, enable them to deliver the kind of volunteering experience and outcomes that you want, but not worrying too much about this being a one-off experience for them. If you remember I said at the Literary Museum, actually most people came in not as particularly interested or knowledgeable about the literary figure, but when I later on in my research asked them about what made them continue volunteer and the rewards they took from volunteering, unlike the motivation where the writer didn't feature very strongly, this is where we saw a very strong attachment often to the writers. One of the most rewarding aspects of their volunteering was self-development and the ability to share their knowledge with visitors. Both the addicts and the amateurs developed incredibly strong ownership of the literary figure that the house belonged to, had, had belonged to, but also the house and the literature that it embodied. Here's a quote from a volunteer who actually, when she started volunteering, um, really knew very little, if at anything, about the literary figure. She'd worked at the, the museum for a number of years and talked about how over time she'd learnt a lot about her, but she'd also grown very fond of her too. They were actually talking about the writer, all of whom were deceased, in very personal terms, and this is often what made them continue volunteering. They really valued the special access that being a volunteer gave them to the life and the um, environment of the particular author. So this again is important, why it's important to not just stop looking at, stop at why volunteer, but to actually understand what keeps people volunteering and how they're rewarded. If we look at this as an idea as a volunteer journey, we can think about this capturing volunteers at different parts of a life cycle. And I'll use the, the, use the example of events to demonstrate this. I've already talked about the Rugby World Cup and how people wanted to be part of the event um, and have social experience um, and, and make social connections. We also in research asked them about their expectations, and their expectations is that it was going to be fun that they'd meet people and they'd have a really positive experience. Now luckily, um, when we questioned them just after the event had finished, largely these expectations were met. The high points of the event were about meeting people and feeling part of the experience. But it's also important to recognise it's not just about the things that go well. So we deliberately also asked people about their low points. Now, a fifth, even when prompted, said there were no low points from their experience of being involved in Rugby World Cup. But for those who did identify um, low points, 
They tended to be either occasional incidents, some of which they describe in great detail in the survey about a single, a single visitor um, incident. But there were also some operational challenges here as well particularly around the volunteer shifts, the amount, the timing, and the nature of the volunteer work. Now, with a couple of exceptions of some roles which were, were particularly challenging, most people were complaining that they didn't do enough volunteering. They wanted to do more shifts, and they wanted to get more involved. And then after the event, we can start about learning from the event and where it feeds into the next one. So taking this into the management space, if we understand motivation, before the event we can look at how we recruit and select, how we train and manage expectations. We can, during the event, look at experiences, rewards and satisfaction. And then after the event, we can either think about how we can try and get commitment to retain volunteers to, to bounce back and volunteer again. Or we can look at volunteering legacies, which I'm going to move on to in a moment, and look at how volunteering at one event or in one experience could actually impact into other volunteering experiences as well. Now through all of this work, um, what's been important to me is the idea that volunteers are managed. Now that doesn't necessarily fit well with all types of volunteering, um, but even in volunteer run and leisure orientated volunteering, there's some real benefits for thinking about volunteering as being a series of stages that the volunteer goes through where the organisation can actually influence that experience. So this, for example, is some work I did with Carolyn Cordry for the Lottery Grants Board and Department of Internal Affairs, where we looked at some of the key success factors for encouraging and supporting volunteers and looked at this from a management perspective. Some later research, some later work, and some of the work I'm proud of, um, really proud of being involved in is with Volunteering New Zealand, where over the last six to seven years, we've been involved in, in developing, testing, and now implementing best practice guidelines for volunteer involving organisations. And these are now internationally recognised in the sector as leading examples of how we can actually recognise and support volunteering. In both of these cases, often a key aspect is the manager of volunteers. And I don't have time to talk about this strand of my research in really um, any detail at all, but um, doing some research with volunteer managers in New Zealand back in 2010 with Carolyn Cordry, we really started to push the recognition of the manager of volunteers, whatever they might be called, being a really key part of the successful volunteer programme and experience. I really like this quote that came from a manager of a large museum um, that I interviewed as a, as a part of a project on the life histories of volunteer managers. And she talked about how volunteer managers are like sort of giant octopus in the centre of an organisation with tentacles going everywhere because they're an integral part of every part of the organisation. And it's been my pleasure over the years um, to be working both with Volunteering New Zealand but also other organisations to support the professional development of managers of volunteers. And that really leads me to sort of the final kind of thrust of my um, lecture, which is looking at how event and tourism organisations can enhance the impact of volunteering. And I'm going to do that by looking at two things. I'm going to talk about the value in the volunteering and then a little bit about some work looking at creating volunteering legacies. Now, when I chose this picture for valuing volunteers, I chose it for a reason that I'll explain in a moment, but it strikes me now that one way you can value your volunteers is by baking for them. They quite like rewards such as food. But I actually chose the picture of a cake because it builds on some work with Carolyn, that I did with Carolyn Cordry Sarah Pro and Sarah Proctor Thompson, looking at different approaches to valuing volunteers, because there are a lot of different methodologies and, and approaches to how you can calculate some kind of value for your volunteers. And we basically put it down to the question of, are your volunteers the cake or the icing? So as an organisation, do your volunteers substitute for essential paid staff? Or perhaps you don't have any paid staff at all, so volunteers are the organisation. In these cases, your volunteers are the cake. And if they weren't there, there wouldn't be anything there. But in some organisations, and sometimes the same organisations, your volunteers can be the icing. They were complement to paid staff. They're the nice to have. If they weren't there, the cake would look quite bare, but it would still deliver. 
but the volunteers can also be the icing that adds the extra value to the organisation. And as I say, there's lots of ways you can then take this concept and think about how you value volunteers. But I just wanted to share with you um, two examples. The one on the right is from Wellington um, Zoo. I'm not sure if we've got anyone from the zoo here. But it's quite typical of an annual report, where in the annual report, there's a recognition that volunteers contribute to the work of the organisation. Um, in this case, about 11,000 hours, the equivalent to almost six full-time equivalent staff. And there's also the recognition that different groups can help in different ways. So in this case, corporate volunteering groups are mentioned. But that's thinking about volunteers as inputs. How many hours, how many volunteers are there there? There are other ways as well, and I really like this example from the back of a bus that was parked outside the office. This is from a couple of years ago from Surf Life Saving. And their message is that every summer, 30 busloads of people owe their lives to volunteer surf lifeguards. So rather than counting the number of hours those volunteers are doing, they're actually counting the difference that the volunteers make in the community. In this case, the, the very real example of lives saved. Now, this interesting value in volunteers, and also my work with Rugby World Cup, led me to think, start thinking more about the longer-term aspects of volunteering, and particularly looking at that in an event context. So as well as Rugby World Cup, I've also just completed a project looking at um, Olympic volunteering, which I'll talk about in a moment. But let's go back to the Rugby World Cup for a moment. There's been quite a lot of research which has surveyed volunteers at an event, and they've asked them at the end, would you like to volunteer again? And this is taken as a, as a proxy for almost success or impact. And we asked this to the volunteers at Rugby World Cup, and at the end of Rugby World Cup, 90% of those that we um, surveyed who have volunteered in the programme said, yes, we would like to volunteer again. And this is very high. Um, other events have achieved similar levels, but you know, this is seen as a positive result. But if you think back to that time in 2011, it's perhaps not a surprise that they were feeling quite good about it. <laughs> As well as the successes on the left, on the right, this is actually a picture of um, Willis Street. The All Blacks and the Web Ellis Cup are on a truck, a flatbed truck there at the front. And all these blue sort of people here are the volunteers. So it was very public recognition and public um, support for the role that volunteers had played about the success of the event. And by default, almost the success of the team as well. But... I'm a bit cautious here. I don't think we can take this as the sort of the, the mark of approval. So one of the things that we were able to do in this study was look at who already was volunteering. Now, out of those volunteering at Rugby World Cup, almost seven out of 10 of them were already actively volunteering in other ways. They were volunteering with community organizations at other events, in other sporting um, and sporting um, clubs. So we need to be cautious about saying, isn't 90% great? but actually think about, well, there is an increase. If we've got 68% currently volunteering from this group and we can boost it to 90, well, there's still some positives in there. But that's where research tends to stop. But because I did a longitudinal study, I was able to go back to the same volunteers six months later and actually find out what they were doing. And the results are interesting. There was a boost in volunteering amongst those who'd been involved in Rugby World Cup but it wasn't as great as the intentions. Some people weren't able to volunteer because they couldn't find an opportunity which met their time requirements or the experience that they were looking for. Many of them wanted to replicate that really intense experience they'd had at Rugby World Cup. And it's very hard for many community organisations to offer that same kind of experience. So in this research, we were able to look at what actually does predict whether or not somebody will volunteer again. And while stated intentions aren't um, d overestimate the scale of the volunteer legacy, they are still a good intention. If you say you you're going to volunteer, you're more likely to be volunteering six months later than if you said you weren't. But previous volunteering was also important. So those people who were currently volunteering or who had volunteered in the past um, were more likely to be volunteering after the event than those who'd never volunteered before. Now, this is important because often one of the reasons for putting lots of money into a volunteer program at a big event is because it will bring new people into volunteering. And this research suggests that's not successful. 
It was also interesting that the event experience had really little impact on whether people would volunteer again. So regardless of what role they did, how satisfied they were, that didn't seem to impact on whether or not they'd volunteer again. And it's also worth noting that the beneficiaries of any increase in volunteering are, were sports and events. The wider community and voluntary sector didn't really see um, an increase in volunteering um, um, in this particular case. We then followed this up, and this is some work that um, I've just completed with Leonie Lockstone, Binnie Kirsten Holmes, and Richard Shipway. And we did a project for the International Olympic Committee looking at the volunteering infrastructure legacy of the Olympic Games. This partly came from the experiences of Rugby World Cup and other events, where a lot of money and effort is put into hosting the event and into the event volunteer program. But we were interested in whether or not these big events were engaging with the volunteering infrastructure that was already there, the national and regional volunteering organisations, community and non-profit organisations who were there before the event took place and would be there after the event had closed down. We looked at two case studies. We looked at Sydney 2000 and we looked at London 2012. Now in Sydney, um, there were some successes, there were some, was some evidence of some engagement with the local community and voluntary sector before the event took place. But it was very much a bottom-up approach, it was because the, volunteer, the voluntary sector were pushing for that, and really any legacy from the Sydney um, Games was due to the voluntary sector really taking on board that idea and keeping going with it. The year after the Olympics was the International Year of the Volunteers, so they used the Olympics as kind of the, the um, trigger for some other activities. But it was really pushed by the voluntary sector rather than the event itself. In contrast, um, London 2012, um, 12 years later, legacy was all over the Olympic Games. Olympic Games are now awarded not just on how well you'll deliver the Games, but how well you can deliver or promise to deliver a legacy. So London had high expectations around legacy. They took very much a top-down approach where the organisers were trying to um, decide, we will do it this way. And really, we saw a lot of alienation of the community and voluntary sector. So that now, a few years after the London 2012 Games, we're not seeing the potential legacy that we could have done from the investment in that event. And what we saw across both examples is, once the game's packed up and gone, everyone's gone home, it's the remaining community sector who really have the ability, if they are supported and resourced, to deliver on a legacy. So, to bring my lecture to a conclusion, I kind of touched a little bit on some of the challenges of volunteering. I've talked a bit about the costs to organisations touched a little bit about on some of the ethics that are involved in certain types of volunteering, whether or not that be um, unpaid internships and questionable, uh, uh, questionable employment practices, some of the challenges around what some aspects of volunteer tourism. But I want to end on some positives. So I want to end up on some four benefits of volunteering and why, to me, volunteering matters. So first of all, the benefits to volunteers. I hope you've heard me talk about the personal benefits that can be gained from volunteering, health and well-being outcomes, the ability to do something for oneself as opposed to perhaps family or work obligations, personal development, education and learning, perhaps potentially increased employability which we've seen through other studies I've been involved with with student volunteers. My partner Simon and I met volunteering so you can have some quite long-term <laughs> benefits from volunteers. I didn't tell him I was going to say that. Um, but also, if tourism and event organisations and the wider uh, tourism and events sector, I think, can also benefit. There are organisations which are wholly or partly dependent on volunteers, particularly in the non-profit sector, but also the public sector and, to some extent, the private sector can also depend on volunteers as well. Volunteers can bring enthusiasm, passion, skills and time, and if properly supported, um, can enable organisations to achieve their missions and goals. Volunteers can act as ambassadors for tourism and events, both those who have titled with that to meet and greet for, um, visitors, but also in the wider sense that they can act as ambas ambassadors within their community, supporting the sector's social licence to operate. <laughs> 
When we talk about the impact on visitor experience, in other cases I might talk about the impact on clients, but in this case clients are going to be the tourists, the event attendees, or perhaps participants in events like athletes. These also benefit hugely from the work of volunteers, whether or not it's the surf lifesavers patrolling the popular tourist beach, a docent guide in the museum educating visitors, marshals at an international triathlon. Volunteers don't just enable these events to take place or these activities to happen, but they enhance the experience of those involved. They can also perhaps have a wider impact through, trans, um, through promoting, for example, conservation messages or encouraging word of mouth and repeat visitation. And then volunteers can also impact on communities and societies. They enable these events to take place and, through, and, and tourism organisations to operate and through those contribute to environmental conservation and stewardship, civic pride and the development of social and human capital. Some of the work that we're doing a volunteer in New Zealand at the moment is looking at the UN Sustainable Development Goals and whilst the idea that volunteers solve world peace is perhaps a little bit of a, great, um, a bold statement to, to almost finish on, Without the work of volunteers, these sustainable goals are going to be hard to achieve because volunteers make an impact on achieving these sustainable goals um, in a range of different ways. So what I would like to finish on is a poster that I have up in my office. And sometimes people come in and sort of say, you've got a poster from 2013, don't you want to update it? But I keep it there because actually for me it's part of really what I see the importance of volunteering. And in this, this was a poster that was designed for National Volunteer Week in 2013. And it contains the Māori whakatoki, um, He ate te me nui o te awa, what is the most important thing in the world? He tangata, he tangata, he tangata. It is people, it is people, it is people. Thank you.